Well, welcome to BI 101, Bibliology and Bible Overview, taught by the New Covenant College here at the Institute of the New Testament Baptist Church in Dover, Tennessee. We come now to our 13th lecture, and last week, you remember, or last class, we covered the Pentateuch, and uh, now we will be looking at the books of the Bible known as the Old Testament historical books. Historical books, Old Testament historical books. And it's important for you to, as we're going through here, to make sure that you are taking note of these sections that we're using. Make this K look a little more like a K. Uh, the sections that we're using here, and um, uh, make sure that you can repeat this outline uh, in your mind as you're going through the Bible and you're thinking, okay, what section uh, am I coming to now as we're reading this? The Old Testament Historical books include all of the books from Joshua to Esther. So we pick up where we left off, and we are going to look at the books from Joshua to Esther. There are 12 of them in total. Now, we make the distinction of Old Testament historical books because the New Testament contains some historical books as well at the very beginning. But for this lecture, all reference to historical books pertain to the Old Testament, unless otherwise noted. Okay? Uh, now, obviously, we won't be able to do a full overview of each book in one session, so we will uh, only examine the context and the contributions of the historical books and uh, look at some key places within this section of the Bible as we go along. Uh, in the Hebrew Bible, with its tripart division that we discussed in the previous lecture, Joshua through 2 Kings are part of the section referred to as the prophets, all with the exception of Ruth. Ruth, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, and First and Second Chronicles are a part of the writings. Okay, so we have the law, the prophets, the writings. Um, so, in other words, what I'm saying to you is that the books are in the same, uh, are, are the same. It's just the order that has changed. So, in our English Bible, uh, we have the books um, from Joshua to Esther in order. So what is the content of the historical books, the Old Testament historical books? Well, as their name implies, the historical books deal with the history of God's people, Israel, and consists almost entirely of historical narrative. Historical narrative. The Bible is not just a history book. But there is a lot of wonderful history incorporated into Scripture. And the historical books cover Israel's history, from their possession of the land down to their return to the land after the two captivities of the northern and southern kingdoms, which came as a result of their rebellion and lack of faith. Okay? The historical books span approximately 800 years, reaching from the 13th century B.C. to the 5th century B.C. So there's a lot of time that's covered in the historical books. Now, these centuries logically fall into six divisions. I'm about to give you the six divisions of Israel's history in the Old Testament. This is very important information, and uh, if you have a test to take later, you might see this again. So it's important that you uh, understand and uh, remember these divisions. So, six divisions, chronological divisions of Israel's history. You have the period of conquest. Let's do it this way. The period of conquest. Uh, this period lasts from 1406 to 1380 B.C. 1406 to 1380 B.C. Uh, secondly, you have the period of the judges. The period of the judges. This period lasts from 1380 to 1050 B.C., the period of the Judges. Third, you have the United Kingdom, and we're not talking about an island off the coast of Europe. But you have the United Kingdom. And this period of Israel's history lasted from 1050 to 931 B.C., 1050 to 931 B.C. 
Then you have, fourthly, the divided kingdom. The divided kingdom, and this period lasted from 931 to 586 B.C. You have, fifthly, the exile. The exile. The exile lasted from 586 to 539 B.C. 586 to 539. And then you have the post-exilic or post-exile period. post-exile, and this period lasted from 539 to 424 B.C. The last 400 years leading up to the coming of Christ, there are, is no revelation given. So if you understand these periods, conquest, judges, united kingdom, divided kingdom, exile, post-exile, and you understand the Pentateuch, you understand the calling of Abraham, and you understand... Uh, Israel going into Egypt and you understand Israel being led out of Egypt by Moses, if you understand that and you put it together with this, you now understand all of Old Testament Israel's history. All the way from the calling of Abraham to the last thing we know about them before the first coming of Christ. So it's very important that you understand these divisions. Let's look at the theological and biblical significance of the historical books. These books make the Christian religion very different from other religions in the ancient East. That is because other religions involved uh, mythological stories to explain the origins and progressions of mankind. If you look at other religions that come out of Mesopotamia and the ancient Near East, you'll see all kinds of foolish legends and tales. But the Bible includes an accurate and attestable account of world history. The Bible presents itself straightforward as a historical narrative. And the Bible then bases its claims around this framework. The, you, you have to understand the history of the Bible in order to understand uh, what's going on and the significance of what's going on. So as you're reading something in the Bible, let's say you're reading the Old Testament, and you're trying to figure out what's going on. Well, remember that lecture uh, on hermeneutics and principles of interpretation. We have a historical hermeneutic, right? So ask yourself, what period of Israel's history am I in? Am I in the period of the judges? Or am I in the period of the divided kingdom? Or where am I at? And if you understand that, it'll help you to piece it together of what's going on. Just like if you're studying American history, you want to ask, well, who's the president at this time? What are some other events going on? Are we talking about the antebellum period? Are we talking about the... Uh, the Roaring Twenties, what, what's going on? Well, it's the same with Israel's history and biblical history. Um, the historical books demonstrate that God is intimately involved with the affairs of men. God reveals himself progressively in time and space. Furthermore, we see that God is sovereign over human history. History, here's a good definition. History is the eternal decree of God coming to pass before our eyes. History is the eternal decree of God coming to pass in time. That's what history is. How can one read the story of Ruth or the story of Esther and not see the sovereignty of God raising up rulers and putting them down? How can we fail to see God's manipulation of the nations as he blesses and chastises his covenant people at various times. God is sovereign over human history, and he is intimately involved in the affairs of men. The period uh, of Israel's history and the events that befell them are reflective of the principles in the Pentateuch. If you understand the blessings and the cursings of the law, then you'll understand why when you read the historical books, at times when Israel was processing an obedient faith that they were prospering in the land, but when they were unbelieving and disobedient, they were driven out of the land. And the historical books also prove the accuracy of Scripture. When you study the accounts of the Bible, 
compared to secular research, you will find that the Bible astoundingly presents a true narrative of world history. Even when there is a secular account that contradicts the Bible, it's far more logical to accept the biblical record. Well, now, aside from the fact that the Bible is inspired of God and infallible and cannot contain error, it's also just logical to accept the Bible's claims. Now, that's because the Bible possesses two things that no secular historian has. Number one, the Bible has an eyewitness knowledge of all of the things that it's purporting. It's not someone studying archaeological and genealogical research and then writing about what they think happened after they pieced it together, but it's men that were there writing in the lifetimes of other men that were there. Secondly, it is a point of view that is able to distinguish what is important within the historical context. See, God is omniscient, and God has a pure motive to record history. There's no bias there. Look at the redemptive significance of the historical books, the redemptive significance of the historical books. Uh, the historical books trace the plan of God that began in the Garden of Eden and climaxes in the coming of Christ. So again, we have this scarlet thread all throughout the Bible, and we see that traced even in the historical books. We see the fulfillment of the seed promise as Israel as preserved as a distinct people group in order for the Messiah to come. Why did God preserve Israel? Is it because they were just this grand nation that just deserved the blessings of God? No, it was because God had purpose to use them to bring forth the Messiah. There were many times when it seemed like all hope was lost, uh, like Israel would be wiped off the face of the earth. Yet God delivered his people. God delivered his people. The study of biblical history is just stocked full of spiritual lessons. We see morality and ethics. We see the penalties of sin and the blessings of disobedience. And we see the faithfulness of God in keeping his word. The historical books teach us that history is not circular. I'm sure you've heard that old saying, well, history is destined to repeat itself. Well, history doesn't repeat itself. History is not circular. History is linear. History is moving towards an ultimate consummation. There is a point to history. We are going somewhere. And as we read the historical books, there's one great message that should jump out at us. Christ is coming. And he did come. And now, in the New Testament, as we look at history, and as we look at the, the things that are coming to pass, we should see that Christ is is coming again, right? And the advancement of his kingdom and the victory of his gospel is taking place right before our very eyes today. So that's what we see when we look at just a general overview of the historical books. I want to look now at the overview of the books themselves. We're not going to be able to get too deep or too detailed, but I do want to just hit some highlights of these books known as the historical books. The first book, of course, is Joshua. Joshua picks up where Deuteronomy leaves off as the faithful generation is going to march into the promised land and Israel takes possession of the land. Once they do that, of course, the land is divided amongst the tribes and the layout of Israel is pretty much established in its embryonic form for the way that it will be leading all the way up to the time of Christ or at least until the time of the captivities. Joshua serves as a great type of Christ that shows our Lord conquering sin and leading us into spiritual blessings by faith. You remember that Joshua didn't win any of his battles because of his military might. Joshua didn't win any of his battles uh, because he was just such a great tactician, though he was. But Joshua won his battles because he trusted in the Lord. Then we have the books of Judges and Ruth. Uh, well, we understand because of total depravity and because of the fall that it doesn't take man very long to mess things up. And they got into the land and Israel began slipping into idolatry and apostasy. And that is the cycle that we have in the book of Judges. Uh, Israel sins, turns from God, apostatizes. God brings some force, some foe to judge his people. God's people get right and they repent. 
And then God sends a judge or a deliverer who rescues his people. And then Israel begins to serve the Lord. And then they apostatize. And so that's the cycle that we have in the book of Judges. God delivering his people on behalf of unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. And the book of Ruth is there nestled into the book of Judges. Takes place there in the book of Judges. It's one of my personal favorite books of the Bible. I love the book of Ruth. It is rich with practical applications and Christological truths. Remember the key word for those days. That is this period right here that we're talking about. There was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. What a shocking statement there as we see our own culture and society following after that same pattern. Then we get to the books of First and Second Samuel. Uh, now it's important for you to understand that these, these books, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, and First and Second Chronicles, were originally written as one book. So it wasn't as if the author was writing part one and part two. No, he wrote one, one book, one scroll, probably, what he was writing there. Uh, but they were separated at a later date because of their length. Okay, so uh, First and Second Samuel are, are one book and need to be understood as a cohesive unit. We see the stabilization of the nation under a monarch in First Samuel. So we transition out of this period into this period as we look at First and Second Samuel. Israel got into the land, and what did they say? They said, we want a king so we can be like all the other nations. They demanded this king, and they received a man named Saul, who the people wanted, but who was not God's uh, chief desire for them. And Saul turned out to be a disaster for the people of Israel. But, you know, this is exactly what God said would happen. Go over and read 1 Samuel 8. And you'll see exactly what God said that this king would be. In 2 Samuel, we see God giving Israel a king after his own heart. God gives them a man after his own heart. And of course, that is King David, one of the most prominent figures in the Bible. The book of 2 Samuel highlights the life and reign of King David. And we also see the moral failures of David and his deep and sincere repentance. The books of First and Second Kings, we come to next, uh, there is at first a time of great peace and prosperity under David's son, King Solomon. The nation expands, and Solomon becomes an extremely wealthy and prosperous ruler, and really the, kind of a renowned ruler. Other nations are taking note of King Solomon. But then... The material blessings and, and the riches of the nation, though they're growing, the spiritual state of the nation begins to deteriorate, first with the northern kingdom and secondly with the southern kingdom. One of the most dangerous pe places for God's people to be is in a place of prosperity. And the northern kingdom goes into Assyrian captivity, so we're now we're... Uh, we're getting into uh, from this period of the United Kingdom to the exile period. And, of course, the divided kingdom is also covered there. Before they went into captivity, uh, the kingdom was divided north and south. And uh, the king list of Israel led like a who's who list of apostates and backsliders. And we see just a terrible, terrible lineage of kings. And the same happens for Judah, with the exception of a couple revivals that took place in Jerusalem and, and Judah. Uh, why, why might that be? What did, what did the southern kingdom have that the northern kingdom didn't have? The temple, right? The house of God. And there's another important spiritual lesson for us. When you get away from the house of God, it becomes very difficult to lead a godly life. And so uh, there were some revivals that took place in the southern kingdom, but eventually, as the prophet Jeremiah said, Judah followed her treacherous sister right into the same type of sin. The chief sin there, funny enough, was a violation of the fourth commandment, a Sabbath breaking. They had gone centuries not obeying the Sabbath. And so God took them into captivity, and he said, I'm going to get my Sabbath one way or another. And he made them pay back all those Sabbaths in one captivity. 
So we see that in the book of First and Second Kings. And then, as I said, that book ends with after we have the United Kingdom under David and Solomon, or Saul, David, and Solomon, and then the divided kingdom under a, a host of kings, we then go into the period of exile. Uh, before we get into the period of exile, we stop by the books of First and Second Chronicles, which really, these books uh, focus on the religious and spiritual aspects of Israel, and they primarily focus on the southern kingdom. We see in these books David, uh, commissioning the temple and collecting the material. And then we see Solomon, his son, building the temple. And we know that this temple, Solomon's temple, was destroyed when the Babylonians deported Israel. So then we're in the period of the exile, Assyrian and Babylonian captivities, respectfully. And then we come to the books of Ezra. Ezra. Now, um, it's interesting that we do have some exilic prophets, but we don't have very much writing during the period of the captivities. The next bit of uh, the historical books, going to the book of Ezra, begin with the post-exilic period, or the post-exile. The Assyrian and Babylonian captivities come to an end, and the Israelites begin to return to the land. And upon their return... The very first thing they do is restore the temple. They rebuild the temple. Ezra is the name of a scribe who teaches Israel to once again obey the law of the Lord. And we see a great spiritual truth here. Israel had left the ordained place of God for worship and service, and they had forgotten the laws of the Lord. And so upon their return, they, are, they have to have Ezra to come and teach them how they are to behave and how they are to live once again. When we leave the will of God, sin takes us captive and we forget how God is to be served. It's a very poignant spiritual truth that we see in the book of Ezra. Then we come to the book of Nehemiah, uh, which focuses on the rebuilding of the city, of the city. And there's a wonderful spiritual teachings and types and pictures in the reconstruction of the walls around Jerusalem. The walls, the rebuilding of the walls. And even though Israel was able to return to the land, God had, God had uh, prophesied that the decree would come, and he pinpointed it to the day. And the decree came, and Israel was allowed to go back into the land. Uh, but they were still not free from all harm. They had enemies. And you'll remember they rebuilt those walls with a shovel in one hand and a sword in the other. Uh, it's a great spiritual truth there as well. Nehemiah was the name of the leader who supervised the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Very bold, courageous leader. And then the last historical book is the book of Esther. Ruth and Esther are the only two Bible books named after women. And uh, Esther is similar to Ruth in that it is a story within the broader story. So Ruth is a story within the book of Judges. Esther is a book um, within the story of the post-exile period. It takes place between the first returns of the Israelites to their land. The first return was led by a man named Zerubbabel, and the second return was led by Ezra. And Esther takes place in between those two returns. Uh, an evil character named Haman plotted to murder all the Jews in Persia. But King Ahasuerus, the Persian king, had chosen Esther to be his wife, who, unbeknownst to him, was a Jew herself. And Esther had a, a godly relative named Mordecai who persuaded Esther to save her people, and she risked her own life and saved the Jews there in Persia. Esther is the only book in the Bible that has no direct mention of God. There's no direct mention of the Lord or Jehovah or, or God anywhere in the book, but his sovereign providence is everywhere in the book of Esther. So we see there that uh, Esther is a, a very interesting book, and, and Esther and Ruth are often studied together. So when we look at the historical books, we understand that the, or the, the ultimate message is very clear. God controls time and circumstances, and he works all things together to accomplish his decree and for the good of his people. 
So read the historical books to learn the facts of history, but also pay special attention to the details and see the beautiful pictures of Jesus Christ and all the evidence that points to him as the centrality of the divine plan. These are the historical books, and when we meet together next time, we'll look at the poetical books. Thank you, and God bless.